So I'd like to introduce Liz Yip. Liz is a seasoned healthcare professional with a rich background in midwifery and lactation support. With qualifications including registered nurse, registered midwife, an international board certified lactation consultant, and a postgraduate certificate in women's health, Liz has dedicated her career to promoting breastfeeding and supporting women's health. Her extensive experience spans over four decades, including work in various midwifery areas and the neonatal ICU. Liz is not only a certified breastfeeding educator, but also a co-author of several published papers on breastfeeding topics and story collector for the book, Spilt Milk, Honest Breastfeeding Stories. Despite retiring from clinical work in 2023, she remains actively engaged in research projects aimed at improving, improving breastfeeding practices. Beyond her professional achievements, Liz's personal journey marked by her resilience in managing conditions like ADHD, dyslexia, infantasia, and chronic fatigue syndrome has shaped her unique perspective and unwavering commitment to women-centered care. I will now pass over to Liz. So thank you very much, Bill, for that. That was a nice introduction. Um, I'll apologize if I cough occasionally through the talk. I've managed to get some viral thing. Um, I would listen to Linda Day's talk, and it's very much on the same theme of what we do <clears throat> matters and really matters, and we've got to be careful about what we do and what we tell women. Um, and she was calling it obstetric neglect, and I think as a whole, midwifery often does the same with breastfeeding. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> we need to think a lot about what we're doing. So what we do matters and why listening to women can change future practice. In, uh, sorry, I've got the wrong view again. Oh, what view have you got? I just set it up to see you. Well, that doesn't matter. We'll work on that. <laughs> can you share your slides or you can't see your, the slides? Uh, no, I can't. Switch no. to shared content. That, yep. That's better. Yeah, I had oh. me and a whole lot of other stuff. That's I do right. apologise for my uh, lack of um, working with Zoom. I tried to ignore it as much as I could for the last five years. <laughs> so next you screen. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so um, just some acknowledgement. I wanted to use the term women breastfeeding and breast milk as these are terms used by the women in their stories. And I acknowledge that those who use different terms I want to acknowledge the Camaragal peoples who were the first people on the country I live on. I'd like to acknowledge all named and unnamed women who've birthed on all our lands. Um, not every woman is named. Humanity and womanhood is very messy, messy and individual in business, and the messy bits rarely recorded, despite the many books I've learned from about pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, and parenting should look like. I've never seen two births or breastfeeding relationships the same. Next slide, thanks. So I'll be reading through some of these slides and then I'll be chatting to you. So please bear with it. Supporting breastfeeding and breast milk is supporting our future. Every breast feed or breast milk feed is one less breast milk substitute. Poor support at birth leading to early weaning increases the use of breast milk substitutes. Every feed has an environmental footprint and breastfeeding has the lightest. Every breast, feed, breast milk feed is important supporting mothers and babies' future health. This means a lighter health and environmental cost in the future. We all need to learn, listen and question so we can support our future families. Next slide, please. I want to apologise to all the women I didn't listen to. I want to apologise to all the women I didn't know how to help. I want to apologise to all the women I couldn't help and I want to apologise to families, women and all my colleagues when I taught what I was taught that later was found to be wrong or at least not helpful. There's a lot of that happening and has happened in breastfeeding over the 40 plus years I've been working. I've had to learn how to see what I knew was not helpful. That's very hard. I had to learn how to personally accept that at times I got it wrong for women, babies and families and that what I taught continued practices that were not helpful. This is a tough journey for all of us to go through. Next slide, please. So we in health, particularly with breastfeeding, but with all of health and, and in maternity care, there is, you know, most in health that are in one of the many fields of health now agree that breastfeeding is the human normal and we should be supporting women to breastfeed. 
that was not so true in most of the 20th century. While promoting breastfeeding over the years, I've heard most of the arguments for and against supporting breastfeeding and having codes of practice against marketing of breast milk substitutes. The big one is, will we make the women feel guilty if we tell the community breastfeeding is best? <clears throat> How do we promote breastfeeding and breast milk as human normal and support the women who can or don't want to? Remains a difficult fine line in the individual care of women. If we don't promote breastfeeding as a human normal, we'll see this back in the 1970s when most babies were bottle fed. You'll all have been through that talk about, oh, she told me to or I had to, or and there's some chat about why do we use breast is best? And we used breast in best in the 90s, 2000s, 1980s, because we were fighting against a Western society world where more than half of the babies were <clears throat> bottle fed. The statistics aren't great, but those of us who lived through it knew that most babies were bottle fed. It was unusual to be breastfeeding. Next slide, please. So um, I'm a 60, you can read that quickly yourselves really, but I'm a 66 year old and I've been listening to women's stories all my life. I started nursing in 1976 and have been working in women's children health since 1980. I am well aware of the history of breastfeeding support and the very poor support through the, out the 20th and into the 21st. It's not just Western health, but most countries who birth their babies in hospitals under the control of doctors, nurses and midwives. And we need to acknowledge as nurses and midwives what we did to women. You could say still doing at times. We were often complicit with doctors in very inappropriate care, though most of us believed what we were doing was best at the time. All health professionals are a team of family and like families often dysfunctional, but need each other to care for the complexities of of caring for women and their babies. So we, and I can't read that last word, uh, and their families. We really do. I keep hearing, at time, sometimes hear that, you know, midwives don't need doctors, but doctors will tell you they need midwives and we need them. It is very much a often dysfunctional team, but there are times when we need doctors um, for complicated births or someone. Women often need help that's not just midwifery care. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what I want you to take from today's pre presentation, please question everything, including the latest research and the latest gurus. Listen to women, babies, and their families. We frequently, we can be frequently wrong, and especially when we tell people to live the perfect life that we can't and don't. Most of us as midwives couldn't live the life that we tell women in antenatal care. Respect everyone's background. You won't be culturally inappropriate as often if you acknowledge there are many ways to live and many do not have the finances to follow all our rules. Every mother and baby come into their own unique families. Try not to judge them by your beliefs and standards. Help them navigate their lived world. While many women can breastfeed, some can't and some don't want to. Keep fighting for a better world, a world that is mostly full of good people just trying to live their best lives. Next slide, please. So what can we do? We firstly need to acknowledge babies as amazing and individual human beings. All of us need to learn how breasts work a bit more than a basic level. We need always to remember that mother and baby are a team of individuals with their own individual joys and challenges. We need to remember everyone has their own body and breast shape and this influences positioning and attachment. There is no one position and attachment. We need to remember that each breast is independent of each other. We need to remember that all mothers live in their own life environments. We need to check with women if they can do what we tell them. We need to learn the basics of how drugs do and don't get into breast milk. And then always consider the baby's age and current feeding patterns. Some of the mistakes of the last hundred years would not have happened if we remembered these things. Next slide, please. What can we do? We first, oh, yeah. what else can we do? Do research if you're able. Encourage others to do research. Ask your politicians to do accurate and frequent real breastfeeding statistics. Ask your politicians to start giving grants for research and student grants in lactation studies. Ask your politicians and universities to put breastfeeding in their vision. 
to make sure all midwifery, early childhood health, pediatric nursing courses do breastfeeding as a separate subject, not an add-on to postnatal or nutrition. Ask your politicians and universities to include breastfeeding in medicine and all health courses as a serious matter, not an hour or two. Australia has one university that studies lactation as a separate, whole separate group. <clears throat> Breastfeeding's not owned by anyone. Maternity due up to six weeks, though often they don't see women after the first week or so. <clears throat> ABA is a one, Australian Breastfeeding Association and a Leash League are a separate group that aren't are connected sort of to health now, but not completely. The rest of the health, many, many midwifery courses don't have a separate breastfeeding subject. They bung it in with the rest of postnatal, which often is considered a bit, oh, well, let's just add on. The baby's born, so we don't really have to worry about the rest of it. <clears throat> Breastfeeding is as much an important part of babies' lives as is their safe birth, um, even though we often, we don't know what we're doing half the time. We keep changing the rules. But when you don't breastfeed on whole um, and do the care we did in the 20th century, it's going to take us a while to relearn what is natural feeding and natural birthing. So we need to really push our universities, our politicians, <clears throat> our administration to look at breastfeeding as a separate entity all of its own to support and help women and babies. Next slide, thanks, Bill. So what happened? So I got burnout and now I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then I'll talk about um, how breastfeeding spilt milk came about. So as many of you will be aware, we did um, all sorts of different positioning and attachment rules over the last 20 or 30 years. <clears throat> we keep finding new ways of telling women how they have to breastfeed. So that contributed to my distress because the women couldn't follow any of the rules. We also had women telling me, oh, Liz, I wanted to do skin to skin in theatre and they're not necessarily, when I say skin to skin third, I'm not talking about a doctor automatically handing the baby over to the mother, which is ideal, but just letting the mother hold her baby, you know, giving her time, not spending 5, 10, 15 minutes fluffing around before the mother gets a baby. They asked, and that's what Linda was talking about. The women asked the staff for the baby to hold their baby, and the staff said, no, no, I don't believe in that, so they couldn't get it. This is not just happening at the hospital I worked at. It happens across the, the board. Um, and spilt milk started then with Jen, who I'll talk a little bit in a minute, who wanted her story told. She has genuine breastfeeding trauma. Um, many women have some level of breastfeeding trauma, the same as they have birth trauma, not usually... Um, talked about quite as much though many of you know stories of women who are unhappy about their breastfeeding <clears throat> there is as much trauma with the breastfeeding trauma as there is birth trauma so Jen wanted to tell her story in the hope of getting um, her story published so that there would be better care and we couldn't get it published and I started to ask women their own stories so in the end I put together a book collected all these stories of women telling their own stories in their own words, stories of too much milk, not enough, managing twins and triplets, institutional dogma, family pr pressure, postnatal depression, women unable to breastfeed, women relieved when they stopped breastfeeding, and so much more. It's a collection of stories I wish I'd read early in my career. If I'd had done so, I would have been much better in my chosen career. It's just full of women's stories in their own words, and it makes... I'm now trying to do um, regular posts on Facebook and I'm rereading the stories and it isn't easy to reread a lot of them. Next slide. Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> so Jen wanted her story told <clears throat> to help other women. So then I asked other women if they wanted to tell their stories and I gave them an email address that was just for women's stories. So women absolutely opted in. I did encourage my family more. I didn't access any records at all, so everyone opted in. 
Danny was keen um, among those to tell her story and then serendipitously I saw her at a local coffee shop two days before she left Sydney. She agreed to edit the stories and organise publishing. The women wrote whatever they wanted. Despite the urge, I did not take out any of the stories and ed Danny edited to fit the book. She's not involved in health, so happy to tell difficult stories. So the women wrote in, sent in to the email address <clears throat> because they chose to. So I gave out a lot more forms than I got. And then all I told them to do was write what they wanted to do. So this is not what you're supposed to do. You, if you were doing it professionally, you'd ask them a whole list of questions. You get them to <clears throat> say all sorts of things. But what I did was just ask them to write whatever they wanted to do. Next page. Thanks, Bill. So who contributed? There were women I met in the lactation clinic I worked in. They were given the email address and could opt in if they wished. Family, friends and a few colleagues who also replied to the email address. Others were very serendipitous and very random. These serendipitous stories help with the depth of experience. The mum of triplets walked, I live in the, my family live in the country. <clears throat> she used to go past every Sunday morning where I would have breakfast when I was visiting and my sister with her triplets and another little one and my sister asked her later um, had she breastfed them and she said yes she had um, much as I was tempted I didn't run out and chase her and say do you want this and then serendipitously I was up another weekend where she was doing a street stall and I gave her the form and she replied the mum of nine which included a neonatal death death is the mother of the 19-year-old ward clerk in the antenatal clinic where I was based. She said, oh, I was just chatting because I chat. Um, and she said, oh, mum would love to. And her mother did and talks about the tears running while her milk was leaking while she was sitting in the bath. The mum who had a bilateral mastectomy prior to the birth of her first baby came to me through another woman I was seeing with who needed breastfeeding support. And I asked her, oh, no, I wouldn't. She said, but my friend might like to. I gave her the form and she got back to me. And it was, I, I think these stories really give balance to the book. It's not just a book of I had a lovely time and it's not a book of I had a terrible time, though it was more difficult to get the good stories. Women who, who didn't have any trouble breastfeeding would say to me, oh, Liz, but it feels like I'd be skiting. I said, no, 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 we need the balanced stories. I also got um, a story of a mum who birthed in India in the 1980s from her daughter. Her daughter, I saw the diary of the mother of the 1970s. There came challenges, came through um, another work colleague of mine and some brave partners have contributed. This book wanted to be published. There was so much serendipity. It wasn't just me pushing people. There was a lot of serendipity of <clears throat> what was happening. Um, it just seemed to want to be published. Next page, thanks. Did that change? Yes, thanks. Okay. So the first, not the first story in the book, there's a, but the first story that led to the book was Jen's story. Um, so there's only a tiny bit of advice from me, only a couple of pages. This is not a how-to breastfeed book. It's a book of women's real and honest stories from women. So Jen had a difficult start, especially with conflicting advice. And by day two of her first baby's life, she felt she was too stupid to breastfeed because each midwife had a different way of telling her and she had to do something differently. This is not new stories to all of you out there. You've heard this story many times. We've got to learn how not to do it. Despite ongoing pain with both of them, she fed for about 12 months. When her second baby was about nine months old, I'd started doing nipple areola swab and found she had penicillin-resistant staph aureus. This is why the antifungal treatment didn't work. Around this time, I'd started swabbing women and doing milk samples as appropriate. <clears throat> um, so we had, prior to 1990s, anyone with burning, stinging nipples or deep burning breast pain, it's just pain. Breastfeeding is not important. Wean, it's not necessary. And women's pain was not believed anyhow. And then we heard that it was um, thrush. And sometimes Oral antifungals were healing women's deep burning breast pain 
And sometimes they certainly helped the nip burning, stinging nipples, but they didn't help anyone, everyone. They did help people, but not everyone. And after a few years of seeing all sorts of bacteria and occasional candida, um, we found there's a lot of different bacteria involved and that um, I got a team to turn my clinical notes into a research project. There's a poster of the preliminary details in that data. I um, am very poor at re writing, and this will take time to get those who have promised to write it up to have the time to write it up for us. The data's there. <clears throat> Qu quick hint, it's not a great idea for your mental health to read your own notes, Three over 360 women's notes. It's not a great practice. It does your head in because my notes are inadequate and illegible and but the swab data is all absolutely accurate. It's straight off. And my notes are accurate. It's just inadequate. Um, but we're getting that done. What we need to do about that is have a list of differential diagnosis for all sorts of pain. It, nipple pain is not just from cracked, you know, from a wrong fitting shield or tongue tie or all the other things. We have to, it's not just positioning attachment. We have to get a differential diagnosis that we learned in nursing training, we need to have for all our midwifery and all our lactation issues. Not just, oh, it's this or that. It can be everything because all women are different. Next slide, please. So Danny's story, Danny was our editor and she's a very good editor because no, uh, we've sold about 200 books and we gave away over 100. We had to give everyone a copy who was in the book and uh, we've given away for promotion and no one has complained about the spelling and grammar. So that's really amazing from a person with dyslexia who still thinks Wednesday, Wednesday. So that was really amazing. She had beautiful calm water births for both her babies. She tried many of the tricks we have for increasing supply, but she was never able to make enough milk. She worked really hard. She did um, lots of pumping, domperidone, supply lines, a whole range of stuff. She worked really hard. She ended up with not much milk and she ended up with postnatal depression. And this is the trauma that happens. So not everyone who can't breastfeed ends up with postnatal depression and not everyone with postnatal depression has feeding trauma. However, feeding trauma can give you postnatal or contribute to your postnatal depression. She was told by an LC at her second birth, which was not in Sydney, <clears throat> that she had great boobs for T-shirts, but not for making milk. And so classic of the low, genuine low supply that she had. She'd never had any breast surgery, lovely looking boobs, couldn't make enough milk. Some women have really unusual breasts and can't make enough milk. Us in the Western world, don't know what other cultures breasts might look like and sometimes we'll go oh they won't make milk and they just work beautifully but they don't look like we should so we should support all women on their start of their breastfeeding journey give them a try whatever's going on let, let them have a try work with them don't tell them they can't work with them if you think they might not be able to certainly give them an option of this might not work but let's give it a try danny wondered why there aren't any tests for low glandular tissue <laughs> why well, she didn't offer any tests, but we're so far behind in breastfeeding research. This is a field that's new and so open for all sorts of research. You know, that your low supply could be your hormones. But I got told in the early 1990s that polycystic ovary syndrome would make no one stop your breastfeeding. And the next year I had the decency to say, oops, we got that wrong. And apparently and a very small group of women with polycystic ovary syndrome struggle with breastfeeding. <clears throat> we don't know hormonal, could be structural, could be genetic, could be trauma to her earlier. We don't know. Not enough research done. It's difficult to explain to women now in 2024 that we don't have the research. It's so distressing. Danny wanted to do the very difficult editing and organising and publishing of spilt milk in her very busy life so that other women can see they're not alone. Next slide, please. Peter's story fits beautifully into Linda Day's talk. Now, Linda did a talk two hours ago 
on um, seizures and our obstetric trauma that we cause there. I forgot what she called it. I'll just have a quick look and see if I wrote it down. Sorry. Um, she talked about coercion and consent and obstetric neglect. <clears throat> and Peter's case was an absolute case of obstetric neglect there. So Peter only one is um, a nurse, not a midwife, but she is a counsellor, breastfeeding counsellor. She only wanted to tell how the midwife refused to let her do skin to skin at a cesarean, despite her knowledge. <clears throat> She's not the only woman that told me that, and this is what got me onto another research project, which is about in the process of being written up by another very busy woman, so it'll take a little while. Um, and there is a poster on that as well with some of our basic data, but it showed exactly what I knew in that some women want skin to skin and love it. Some women don't want the baby near them, a very small number of women. Some women are vomiting. Some women are shaking in seizures. <clears throat> but we're stopping that happen when the women might want it. We're taking the baby away from them. We're putting on their nappy and wrapping them up or not. And just all this delay... And one of the doctors at our hospital wants to do immediate skin to skin and the constant fight is with the midwife. So it's not the midwife wanting it, the doctor stopping it. The doctor finds some women, <coughs> midwives are really happy to do it and others are just, no, 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 can't do that. There's no policy to ban them from doing it. There's no procedure to help them doing it, but they just don't believe in it. And I find that as a midwife, I find that so distressing because it's not women-centred care. It's absolutely not women-centred care and it is exactly what Linda Day was talking about. So we found um, the Skin to Skin Dialogue, which will be published soon. Um, so next, next um, slide, please, Bill. So Remy is a young midwife. Well, I'm 67. She's 31, so it makes her very young. Um, and I'd known her vaguely through family, but she came and saw me because she was struggling with the breastfeeding. And after a very joyful birth, she says, I'm a midwife. I've had countless women attach their babies in birth in the first few weeks of life, tongue ties, twins, poor latch babies with bruised heads after forceps. She knew all the tricks and thought breastfeeding wouldn't be an issue for her. Remy said at birth, I used cross cradle word rules, nipple to nose and shoved my screaming baby's mouth into my nipple. <clears throat> Remy's nipples got sore, they weren't healing. And within two days of using cradle hold and working with her body and breast shape, the nipple starting, her started healing. Remy said I was taught I taught mothers for 10 years cross cradle rules, how sorry I was for all the mums I taught as I was taught and how changed forever I was from this experience. <clears throat> this is one of my really major triggers and how I lost so many friends in the midwifery and lactation world. When I started, we did, you have to sit up bolt right, bolt upright, put your feet on it. You have to sit on your couch. You have to sit bolt upright. You have to have something to put your feet on, probably a, tele, a telephone book when they had big, thick telephone books. <clears throat> Can be helpful for some. Some women have long legs and they certainly don't need to be putting their feet on anything. Some women don't have couches. Some women have a very sore bottom. They wanted to lie on their side. <clears throat> and then we started to learn transitional hold, which was supposed to be for one the first day or two. So you'd support your breast and bring the baby ever so gently, supporting your breast and holding the baby's head. And I regret forever, ever teaching what might've been just a gentle support in the first day or two while their mothers learned to breast. <clears throat> because we then said, you can't possibly feed in cradle hold what humans have been doing for eternity. Lying on your side is also very human normal. The baby has to have the chin to the chest and you grab the breast and you do this and you shove. And I know a lot of people say, that's not what I do, but that's what it feels like to the women and that's what it turned into. And so when I kept saying, oh, since 
at least 2010 or, or earlier, please don't do it. The women hate it. The babies hate it. It leads to breast refusal. I just lost a lot of friends. And then we learned that started to get um, laid back feeding where you're supposed to lie flat on your back. Well, that doesn't work. And then you're allowed to sit up and now every, and then you've got to hold the baby for two or three hours. It, but you need to go, the woman might want to clean. She might want to go to the toilet. She might. So we have to find a balance. Um, and, and the original laid back feeding, the person who did that, the mother had done this before. So the baby was here and it bounced down onto the mother's breast and then the mother picked the baby up and shoved it on the other side. And I'm going, would you just not have cut that out? So the baby had landed in human normal cradle hold, but thought they had to show. And so for the next five years, we had this real difficulty of us going, oh, the baby has to find their own way, but then you have to put them on cross cradle, even though they're on. <clears throat> and now, thankfully for all that, we're getting rid of cross cradle, but it will take and not every baby was shoved on. But that's what women describe it as. They shoved the baby on. And, and as Remy said, she'd been pushing the baby on and her baby breast refused. So after this, she then had a whole lot of issues with her baby breast refusing and the baby would only feed lying on her side. So she ended up lying on her side in cars, feeding when she had to go out. The baby would not feed unless she felt like it because babies are all individual and wonderful. Have I got any more slides there, Belle? Yes. So this slide, and I'm watching the time because um, I'm not sure we needed some time for questions. And if not, I can go on with all sorts of stuff that frustrates me. So don't hesitate to contact me by my email. 